What's up, peers, and welcome to Join the Wasabikas, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. And today I am joined by the one and only Jeremy Rubin, who has been contributing to Bitcoin infrastructure projects for quite some time, uh, both in terms of vault constructions and congestion controls and uh, well, side chains and all types of crazy magic uh, that we will talk about today with a specific focus on Sapio, which is well, almost a new programming language, somehow of a smart contracting vehicle that allows for interesting uh, property rights to be defined and enforced in Bitcoin for sovereign individuals. Uh, and I think the mission of Sapio is, is absolutely fascinating and we will get into more of these details right here on the show. As always, thanks to all the contributors who help out making this show possible. Uh, all the editors, Saxnet and Rafay, um, Nubuntu for the timestamps, Yegor for the artwork, and all the others. Uh, toss us some sats with the podcasting 2.0, newpodcastingapps.com, uh, to make this show even better. And without any further ado, let's get into it. How are you today, Jeremy? Hey, Max. Thanks for uh, having me on. I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? Oh, fantastic. And, and really excited to talk to you uh, today, because uh, even though I've been following you for, for a while and, and looking at the things and the magic that you build, just rather recently, I stumbled upon the Sapio website and was absolutely blown away uh, because first of all, well, it's dark mode and that's a good thing. But then also the mission statement and, and the vision uh, and the, the tools that you've been now building uh, is is quite substantial. So I'm, I'm very eager to get into the nitty gritty of this today. But before we get into Sapio, like what drives you to dedicate your time to building Bitcoin tools? Yeah, that's a great question to start with. I think that Bitcoin is perhaps one of the most important technological revolutions um, in, in this modern era that we're in. And I can think of almost no better way of spending my time than driving it forward as much as I possibly can. A lot of the work in Bitcoin is not technical work, it's political work. I look at other ecosystems and communities and I see maybe technical developments that are a lot more exciting things like, uh, you know, zero knowledge proofs or um, some of the DeFi protocols happening in Ethereum, I think are really exciting as well. And I look at Bitcoin and I go, wow, you know, like we don't have any of that kind of things. I think that we don't need all of that. Some of it's kind of uh, noise and not signal. But for the parts that I do think are legitimately signal, I want to see a path forward for Bitcoin to be able to adopt and supplant uh, any of that and remain uh, you know, the decentralized market leader that is going to be a, uh, you know, currency for the entire world. Uh, th that's sort of what drives me and why I spend my time on Bitcoin rather than getting, uh, you know, into the shit coins. And, and what brought you to working on free software more general? Um, yeah, so with the development of Sapio, there's actually quite some period of time where it was not publicly released and I was considering different ways of, uh, putting it out there. I think that there are a lot of challenges in building open source software for the Bitcoin ecosystem um, that make it difficult to both uh, produce and monetize uh, the technology. Um, so I, I don't know if I would say that I am in open source 100% uh, by choice. I think that there's, there's also a, sort of a discrepancy between what is open source and what is uh, free software and what is, you know, Libra software. So those are kind of three distinct categories. Open source is where you're able to see and verify the code for yourself. Um, uh, free software, let's define it. It's, this is not standard, but it's something that you don't have to pay for. And Libra software is software that you have liberty in how you use it and, you know, what it's able to do for you. Uh, I think all three of those are important goals. Uh, the difficulty comes is, you know, sort of like, how do you produce software? So for a while I was looking at, well, for Sapio, what if I were to be able to monetize by saying, essentially everybody who isn't Coinbase can use it for free. And Coinbase has to pay if they're going to use it for something like some licensing fee. I thought maybe that's a reasonable way of monetizing. 
But as I sort of tested those ideas on the community, I received pretty harsh feedback that if I were to implement things uh, that way, that not only would nobody use it, but people would go out of their way to re-implement everything that I had ever built and make sure that there was no way that I could ever monetize it. Uh, that's sort of negative, uh, I, I think, overall. Um, I, I think there's a reasonable way that you can do dual licensing where 99.9% .9 of users have a completely free and Libra um, open source license to use, but you have like some set of actors who don't get that. I think that there are like reasonable things around that, but um, the community is, I think, pretty centered around uh, everything has to be 100% open source Libra. And so I said, you know what, like, it's not my uh, role to change that norm. Um, I will, you know, go with what, with what that is, because I think it's more important that I get out the software that introduces these capabilities and functionality for the entire Bitcoin community than it is that I'm able to monetize off of it. But that's sort of an important point, which is that the Bitcoin community absolutely needs to do better at uh, monetizing uh, builders in the space, because when you're trying to build the most radical self-sovereign software you can, there are a few ways that you are going to be able to insert yourself as a middleman into that. And the more that we uh, do not provide a way of supporting people building that type of software, the less of that software will ultimately get built. So to me, it's a very important issue is how people are able to monetize and something that as a community, we're not doing exceptionally well on today. Yeah, that's a great point, right? Um, building software is crazy complex and very expensive, and it's difficult to find a revenue model uh, so that people actually are willing to give up their precious Satoshis in order to get the software that you use. Right? But there yeah. are, and of course, a revenue-driven approach is very, let's say, successful, I think, especially because there's a feedback mechanism involved. Right? If, if you're, if you're revenue driven, then that means your clients actually value the stuff that you do. So you're on a good track. And on the other side of the spectrum, we would have some, well, open sponsorship, uh, or, or donation grant, right? Where maybe the feedback mechanism is a bit more mm, deterred, right? But what, where do you see some, some other challenges in between the approaches or maybe even some new approaches entirely? Yeah. Well, so Judica, which is the entity that I have that owns uh, Sapio um, and, and its development, uh, even though it's open source, you know, at this point, um, is a, you know, C Corp entity. So it's an investable uh, thing. Um, I do believe in capitalism, like a lot of, uh, you know, Bitcoiners, like they might think that uh, the software will get produced as sort of an externality of capitalist activity. But I think the point that you touch on around product market fit and saying, how is the software that I'm producing giving value to the clients? Um, what are they willing to pay for? That is an incredibly powerful force that leads to uh, like the production of high quality tools. So people paying for their tools is actually good because when you have an entity that says, oh, we need to make stuff that's good enough for people to pay for it, that's actually good for getting things that are good. <laughs> uh, and without that, you have a lot of um, maybe things produced by scratch your own itch so problems are only solved when somebody's motivated enough to solve it. And ultimately, like, I don't know what Coinbase internally wants. And with open source software, it's relatively difficult for me to uh, have a commercialized relationship with, uh, with uh, you know, downstream providers. So I think that that is something that I'm sensitive to. Uh, the, the reality is with the grant model, it's really bad for funding teams. Uh, I would really benefit from having a team of 10 developers around to work on Sapio. Like it's a really big idea. There are a lot of things that need to go into it to making it the best possible tool. Um, and there are different uh, aspects that as a solo developer, not only do I not have the time to develop all of those, but I don't have the skill necessarily. Like I'm a pretty decent uh, programmer and engineer. Um, I'm probably, worse than my credentials might suggest. Um, but there are things that are like out of reach for me uh, around like compiler internals that would probably take me years to be able to produce the thing. If I had a team working on it and th the funds to afford a team, uh, I would actually be able to get this to market a lot faster. Um, as a lone mountain man style development, it's pretty difficult to uh, you know afford the resources to drive that forward. So I think that that's where I see the grant model as being good for, you know, some, some amount of independence, 
but it's very bad for allocating sufficient resources to realistically develop large software projects. Yeah, and so so Grant here defined this basically you you give someone money and the rather well rather hands off approach, right? With with you just do something in general that will help the area. Yeah. But what do you think then on the contrary to, for example, bounties right, that are clearly defined? This is the problem. If you find a solution, this is the amount of money that you get. And it could even be an open one, right? So that anyone yeah. who tackles the problem and solves it actually gets paid. Uh, I think that bounties are uh, a decent idea, but they're hard to practically implement. Um, where we've seen success in the uh, programming field is bug bounties, uh, because you can develop a bug and uh, you know vulnerability, and then you can make a proof of concept and you can submit it. And it's pretty clear how to assign um, credit and, and attribution for that. Um, on the other hand, uh, even though you might hear people say like, it's not a feature or not, it's not a bug, it's a feature, um, like bugs are not features. Um, so feature development is a lot harder. Uh, if I were to say, hey, I need a type system for Sapio, uh, and by the way, this is going to be something that's developed in the open, then what's to stop somebody from seeing all the research that happens in the ecosystem and then right at the last mile, doing a hackathon for a week and producing a result and then stealing, you know, all of the work. And so when you're trying to produce uh, something in public, how do you end up assigning the final bounty for something? For example, let's say that there's a bounty for a new coin join protocol and somebody uh, goes out and says, here's what we want the properties to be. But in order to claim the bounty, there needs to be an implementation. And then somebody produced, you know, spends like months developing a spec and the spec is like really good. It's shared on the mailing list. Other people have put feedback into it. They did a ton of work. And then once that spec is basically implementable, uh, some, you know, good developer says, okay, well, I implement it. Here's the implementation. I claim the bounty because I'm the one who satisfied the constraints. Uh, that's something that can happen in a, in a bounty ecosystem. And uh, that can be pretty, um, pretty damaging, I think, for how much time people are willing to invest into the bounties. So the bounties, I think, typically end up being much smaller in scope because it's hard to produce like significant works of engineering under a bounty model because there's no guaranteed payout if you've been putting in the work. Yes, that's true. And there are also a thousand and one ways to, uh, to implement a feature request, right? And, and so many different nuances that cannot really be anticipated up front. So what yeah. if you have a feature request in mind and then someone delivers an implementation that, you know, is roughly there, but there are many other ways how you could have solved the same thing much more elegant. And how do you turn that person down? Uh, is, is that even fair, right? Should, should the bounty be open until it's properly done? Who defines all of these things, right? Many open issues with bounties too. Yeah, so I, I currently have one active bounty and the way that the uh, individual who set it up, first of all, it is a bounty that is only claimable by me. Um, so that exists and it's not a bounty for any specific implementation. It's a bounty for like the concept of something being available to the community. And it sort of is recognizing that, um, it, it's based around check template verify, but it's recognizing that whether or not check template verify gets in, um, to Bitcoin, which is still an open question, uh, the entire ecosystem is benefiting from my advocacy for this general shape of solutions. So whatever ends up getting in, whether it's defined by me or someone else, it, it's going to be based on what I've done. And so that, it, I have a bounty that sort of recognizes that, but it's not, um, uh, it's not claimable by anybody else. If somebody else were to say, Hey, I made some tweaks to check template verify, and here's a better way of doing it. Um, now do I get that bounty? Like they, they wouldn't cause it's based on my advocacy efforts. Uh, so I think that that can work, but it's also very difficult for me to claim that type of income. Uh, like it might take, and I hope not, but it might take five years to get check template verify through. So can I really feed my family on uh, a bounty that is claimable with like five years of work? Um, it's not even like a sure thing. Like that, that's a little bit difficult. So bounties, I think are very hard for people to build uh, reliable income on and reliable income is pretty important to developers overall. Um, they, they don't have enough, like as a developer, you have like time for like one or two projects. So. If you're if you have bounties on both and both take years, like you might not be able to continue actually doing that work from a practical point of view, and you might end up taking a job doing something uh, to you know fill your time rather than being able to actually dedicate your focus on Bitcoin.
Yeah, exactly. Right. And this is the difference between a, a capitalist and a laborer, so to say, in, in the classical defined sense, that the capitalist puts his own money up front, right, and he expends his cash today with the hope that tomorrow he's going to get some revenue in when he satisfies his clients. Right? While the laborer does not have that temporal investment, right? The laborer gets paid today uh, and he is happy and can feed his family today, right? He doesn't have to wait in the uncertain future until the profit maybe comes in and maybe not, right? So not everyone wants to be and not everyone needs to be the capitalist in the sense that forgoes his today's consumption in order to invest this capital and hopefully in the future get a risky return, right? So finding some ways where especially, let's say, artistical jobs, and I would say coding is an art form, um, is kind of removes that risk factor and reduces the uncertainty of the artists so that they know, hey, I can be uh, very creative and not need to worry about the cash flow right now because I know that I'm, I'm, I'm you know, taken care of on the financial side. Yeah, so I think that that gets a little bit, um, you know, abstract. Capitalism in general, I think we both believe is, is good and more things should be capitalistic than not. Uh, I think where it's difficult is that Bitcoin is ultimately a platform for capitalism and having people developing Bitcoin with capitalistic interest is actually bad for Bitcoin in certain senses. So an example of this is let's say that I have two developers, one is a laborer, one is a capitalist, and both are trying to implement a specific feature into Bitcoin. One, the capitalist looks at the problem and says, I know how to solve this problem in a way that I will be able to uniquely earn a profit over the next decade. Um, and, and this is not inconceivable. One example of this would be, uh, hey, I came up with a new signature algorithm that's really great called Schnorr signatures and I patented it. And Bitcoin can use the patent however they want. And we have a carve out that says only major exchanges uh, have to pay a fee for using it. And that would be a way to say, okay, well, you're going to make a lot of money doing that because the exchanges do a lot of high value transactions. Good for you. Bitcoin probably shouldn't adopt that, right? And, and that's historically why Schnorr was not used in Bitcoin sooner is we wanted to wait for the patents to expire. Um, on the other hand, you can have the laborer and the laborer says, hey, well, I was paid to develop this. It's a work for hire for Bitcoin. And this goes into the public commons and it's done in a way that there's no encumbrances or any way of me monetizing. It is a platform for anybody to build on top of. And so that helps the ecosystem of Bitcoin be competitive and not have uh, some sort of middleman to people's business. So I think that that's where uh, there's sort of a mix where you want capitalism to be the incentive for using something. But anytime somebody's able to lock in a way of earning money by Bitcoin being operated, it sort of is a little bit negative for the ecosystem because things should be done uh, with, without middlemen. So, it, so that, that's sort of like, there's this like fundamental tension and developers are definitely caught in the crossfire. If you remember like the shade that Blockstream was getting with sidechains, it was Blockstream is developing sidechains specifically so that Bitcoin will not get any development effort inside of it and all scalability will be pushed onto Blockstream Liquid. Therefore, there will be no transaction fees in Bitcoin. Blockstream is an attack on Bitcoin. That was the argument that was made. And Blockstream is going to develop this technology that's really good, but they're not going to be able to push it into Bitcoin because they're not going to make that effort because they want to incentivize people to use their sidechain platform. These were like 2017 era attacks on Blockstream's business model. That was like the big meme was the Blockstream business model. And there's an element of truth in that, whether or not Blockstream as an entity had that intent at any point is not, you know, my job to weigh in on. But what I can say is that there's definitely that sort of incentive space. You look at something like the Lightning Network and how uh, collateral loaning is forming. There's an incentive to do this in a way that there's an ability to extract a rent on users of the ecosystem uh, rather than developing it in a way that has you know, zero collateral requirements uh, or you know, zero way of monetizing. I, I don't personally think that that's bad. I think developing things in a way that there's a, a possibility for a developer to monetize it 
is not only natural, but probably good because we need to pay for the work somehow. But if Bitcoin does want an ecosystem which has zero middlemen anywhere, then we need to do a better job at investing capital into the platform itself um, with no expectation of a direct return on it. Yeah, and this is the other kind of crazy thing, right? Because usually venture capital is used to finance these recklessly edge case projects. But then again, these these projects usually have some exit strategy, right? To to make a public offering or to get sold out by a different venture fund, right? But well, with free software, there's very few exit strategy strategies that that actually make sense. Like, how did you consider that with Utica being an investable company? Yeah. So the issue I think is is less so exit strategy, um, more so moat, and a moat is how am I going to be the only person who can do this? Um, that, that is central to the exit strategy. Um, but it's not, um, it, it's not necessarily like venture capitalists will continue investing in businesses that don't have an exit strategy as long as they have a moat because eventually the company will have an exit. There'll be some way of going public or, uh, you know, earning revenues as long as there's a moat. Um, and for open source software, putting a moat in is, is actually pretty bad. Um, you can have network effects. So for example, the lightning network has network effects. What's the moat for what if another payment channel technology comes along? Well, it's like, well, everybody already has the lightning network and therefore, um, therefore people will, you know, prefer to continue to use the lightning network rather than something new, but anybody can provide liquidity in the lightning network. There's no exclusivity for lightning labs or for Blockstream or um, async or any of the other lightning, uh, companies. So it's pretty difficult, uh, that anybody will be able to actually capture the market share. Um, that is sort of the major concern. And, and for smart contracts, uh, for Judica, the things that I'm developing, there's sort of multiple layers. There's Sapio, which is sort of table stakes technology for the things that I want to be able to accomplish with Judica. Um, it just needs to exist. It needs to be out there. I don't see there being any value in having a moat around that and saying that I'm the only person who can use this technology because ultimately the ecosystem needs to adapt infrastructure very widely in order for it to be usable. So putting a moat around that would just prevent adoption. And right now I need to drive adoption. I'll figure out the exit later. That's sort of what I'm telling you is that exit is less important than moat. What's the thing that you can do that you have a core competency in? Um, and for, for Judica, I see that there being a couple things that I would have a moat around. One is expertise. Um, that is something that is pretty difficult to build up, but it's not, um, you know, it's not insurmountable. We've seen companies in the Ethereum space build up a reasonable amount of moat. Um, for example, Open Zeppelin has a very good reputation in the Ethereum space because they've worked with a very wide variety of projects. They have standard contracts that everybody wants to use. So if you're using those standard contracts and aren't willing to pay for a sign-off from the Open Zeppelin team, it's a negative indicator for developing a project in that space. Maybe Judica at some point plays a similar role where we say, hey, there's uh, a lot of value we can provide by having us look at your application and audit it, pay us for that. But services businesses are very hard to monetize uh, in a, in a venture-driven way. There are few and far between exits in that. Red Hat is the major one that comes to mind. Um, or maybe MongoDB, but for MongoDB, they have like a, a better tier technology available to corporate clients. So I don't necessarily see that as a solid exit. What I do see as being possible um, is developing out, uh, for example, DeFi protocols uh, on top of uh, Sapio and then market making in that environment. But market making is a competitive uh, thing and anybody can show up with capital. So there might not be a long-term moat around that either. Ultimately, uh, you know, it's it's my job to find something that I can have a moat around. Um, maybe it's operating side chains, maybe it's something else. But for now, I'm more worried about the adoption phase. And that's something that VCs are generally good at as well, is growth at any cost. Growing, getting more people using things, um, and bringing new technology to the forefront. That's the phase that I'm in right now. Uh -huh, very interesting. And and yes, of course, right? This is a, we're, we're all building financial technology here and, and network effects are massive in finances, right? So to, to have that ability and to, uh, well, to get more, more and more people involved is, is critical. So what are some of the strategies that you have now to increase the, the in user base and interest of Sapio? Uh, yeah. So I just put on, um, a week or two ago, 
this event, uh, Pleb Phi, uh, the Bitcoin Miami conference. Uh, it was like a satellite event. And for that, we had something around 80 people come through the day to learn about various things happening in the Bitcoin ecosystem, uh, as well as sort of looking over our shoulder at what's going on in other spaces as well. Uh, and that was really successful, I think, in driving interest in how to use tools like Sapio or how to help mature them. So that was really important. Um, we're going to have another iteration of that event coming up later this summer in Austin around BitBlock Boom. Um, Austin uh, is where the uh, Pleb5 will be. And I think that the BitBlock Boom is actually in Houston. So we'll maybe have a bus for people or something. We'll figure that out, how we get people between them. Um, but that's going to be really important for teaching people uh, more about how they can use these tools and how they can think about applications. It's still a little bit greenfield to actually use Sapio um, in the wild. Uh, you can use it on mainnet today uh, because there are certain features uh, like BIP 119 check template verify that are not yet available in Bitcoin core. Ultimately, you have to make some different trust assumptions. You need a signing server to emulate the functionality. But as time goes on, um, you won't need those trust assumptions and it will be easier and easier to deploy applications to mainnet with Sapio. So right now is the right time to get people involved and to learn from what people struggle with and then uh, fix those things and build more tooling. But it's pretty hard to sit in your armchair and say, ah, oh, I know what the perfect tooling is that everyone needs, it is this. I, I think that that's not capitalistic. Um, it's not necessarily my job to uh, tell people what they want. Um, it's my job to listen to what people are struggling to struggling with and solve those issues in a compelling way. Um, there is a little bit of the Steve Jobs effect where it's if you ask people, you know, what they wanted, um, they would say a faster horse. Um, so I'm not asking people, hey, what is it that you want me to build for you? What I'm trying to do is get people to experiment, fail, learn from their failures and solve the problem for them. But until I know what those problems are that they experience in, in actually building and deploying applications, uh, it will be difficult for me to produce uh, those toolings until I see people actually failing in the wild. Yeah, and this failure is a critical part to the process and, and good that you have it so deep in your mindset. Uh, and, and it seems to me that, that Sapio is somewhat of a, like, like in, that, in that same line of reasoning, it's the, it's the result of looking at uh, Ethereum and, and seeing there are many really cool things that can be built here but there are also downsides, right? And, and, and trade-off decisions. And where where did you see some of those uh, like critical trade-offs? Um, and how does Sapio solve these problems? Uh, yeah, so Sapio is existing in a very bizarre space of programming languages. Uh, it's really not like anything that most people have ever used before, unless you're maybe a programming language theorist uh, or a um electrical engineer and there aren't that many of either of that group involved in like bitcoin development uh essentially for sapio what you are designing is not a program but a circuit and there's a little bit of a distinction between a program and a circuit a program is you know it could be many different things but a program generally is something that is running in some environment and it is, let's say it's an interpreted program, there's some code that's running real time with whatever information is coming into that program, whatever input is. And a circuit is, it's definitely a subset of a program, but a circuit is really like hardware. It's like we've put together these pipes and uh, valves and it's sort of fixed and defined ahead of time. Um, and there's not, uh, it, it's sort of bounded. It's fundamentally bounded. It has to fit within a certain area. And CPO produces circuits. Pro programs, you know, you can have memory, you can dynamically grow that memory and you can have uh, a program that, that does very different things depending on what the input is. But in, uh, in plumbing, uh, in a circuit design, the set of outcomes is fundamentally very fixed. And CPO targets a very fixed type of program. Um, and, and that is not what Ethereum tries to do. Ethereum with Solidity, it's very uh, loose. You know, there's lots of different things that can happen as long as you're paying fees for the storage you take up. Looks good. It can respond uh, dynamically to new events that were not foreseen at the time that the programmer made it. It reacts to new contracts that exist. And you have to make sure that your assumptions in your contract are 
valid against all new contracts that could exist on the network. An example of this where, where that wasn't true is like flash loans. Like there were liquidity assumptions for a lot of DeFi protocols that nobody would be able to, for example, get infinite amounts of a token. But then there were tokens that said, well, actually, we allow people to flash loan as much of this token as we want. Or there are protocols that said you can borrow as much of our available liquidity as we have if you return it by the end of the transaction with a small interest rate. And that broke a lot of the assumptions that people made in that ecosystem. In the Sapio world, things are kind of fixed. Um, and you don't have this sideways composability type of issue. There, there are benefits and costs to not having that. But ultimately, for what I'm trying to do with Bitcoin is... I am trying to move the window of possibility forward. I don't necessarily know that this is like the final resting place, but I think that I want to bite off a big chunk and chew on it. That's sort of the goal for Sapio is to deliver a ton of functionality for people, let the market experiment. And where we realize that people want to do a specific thing that Sapio can't support, then we will expand that functionality further or we'll try and come up with safe designs to do so. Okay, that's so interesting. And, but where's the difference between Sapio and something like Bitcoin Script or Miniscript? Yeah, great question. So Miniscript is actually currently a part of Sapio. Uh, with Sapio, you are defining a commute. And with Miniscript or Bitcoin Script, you're defining a key. And the difference is if you have a key, the key tells you that you can unlock your car or you can unlock your house. Um, it tells you how to operate it. You know, it's like a little car, click the button, a key, turn, put it in the lock and turn, a bus pass, tap it on the reader, right? That's a key. But it doesn't really tell you what you do once you've actually gotten that access. And a commute tells you, here are the steps. So for example, go to the train, tap your, tap your pass, enter and board the train, take the train five stops, then exit the train, walk five blocks to your office, insert the key into the lock, turn it. That's a step by step procedure. And you can have forks in that commute as well. You can say, if it's a Tuesday, it's your day for donut day. So go to the donut shop, pick up donuts, and then go to the office, they will not let you into the office unless you come with donuts. So you can define different types of flows. And it's procedural and stateful step by step by step, you're doing something whereas a key is sort of an atomic single action, click the button, insert the key, turn it. And there's no statefulness to that, if that makes sense. Uh, whereas a commute, there's an expression of what is the next step. That's a very useful analogy. Um, and so in, in your vision of Bitcoin, these two things are very separate. Uh, we have mi Miniscript for the keys and Sapio for the commute, as you say. But how does that compare to, for example, the Solidity language in, in Ethereum? Yeah, so for, I think it's useful to go back to the plumbing metaphor. Um, so imagine you have like a set of pipes and then on those pipes, you have valves and splits and things like that. What Sapio is defining is a, uh, ability for you to turn valves and decide where the water flows. And at the end of that period, uh, some amount of water flows out and maybe, it, you know, if, if you just to kind of work with this visual metaphor, um, you know, those like water wheels that kind of like turn for a little bit and then the water dumps out like a second later, like the water fills up and then uh, the piece of bamboo like flows down and dumps a, you know, a chunk of water. You can imagine that kind of stuff in this big pipe diagram. Um, and that can sort of emulate things like time locks uh, or, or other functionality. So Sapio is really defining this type of flow where the funds should go. And the very end result, there's a spigot and it goes into some predefined cup. And then whoever owns that cup can, uh, you know, take it and drink from it, or they could walk it over to another pipe and they could pour it into that pipe and see what happens, or they could take it and they could take it and pour it back in the same top of that pipe network and then let it flow through again. So that's sort of a little bit of a weird metaphor, but that's what Sapio is. And to compare to Ethereum, Ethereum smart contracts are a lot more like having a virtual assistant and you tell the virtual assistant what things they should keep track of. And that pipe network um, is much more dynamic. So you can say like, hey, look, we have a certain program that we want you to run. Please run this program. And that assistant is going to check it against their internal logic and then execute whatever you've specified. 
but the set of possible outcomes, it's not like a row of cups in the, the water ends up in one cup. It's like somebody prepares your order and does what, what you've asked. And it could really be any type of outcome. They could do something very sophisticated. You could say, hey, look, I have a new cup. Um, please take this new cup and add a pipe to it that says, if uh, you know we've you know uh, waited three days, then put it in this, and then you could ha you could dynamically patch in this this logic. Um, so that that's where it's a little bit different. You can have things that are recursive in Ethereum, so you can automatically have once funds reach the bottom, you can have a pump that pushes the funds back to the very top, and that can happen infinitely. So like a perpetual motion machine. So that's sort of where Ethereum differs from, with Solidity differs from what's possible with Sapio. Sapio is sort of like a fixed flow where you just put the things in and, you know, it comes out. Whereas Ethereum, it's much more interactive. Like there's statefulness and you can add and subtract things while there's water in the system. And you can imagine, this is sort of where there's a natural analogy for what the security vulnerability is. You can imagine that a plumber goes in to change out one of the pipes and doesn't have a valve closed off and then water leaks out everywhere right? And, and you flooded the whole building. Um, that can happen when you have this sort of dynamic logic where you can't verify uh, the set of modifications that can happen on the running program. And that running program actually has money locked up in it. Yeah, I see. So this is some of the, let's say, security benefits of having a bit more well, limited capability as, as APU does. But are there some other rationales why you would choose down that more narrow path? Yeah, I mean, I think the main thing is uh, like, Technically, what can we support in Bitcoin with minimal modifications today that gives us maximum power to define useful applications? And this is what I came up with. Um, I personally think that there is space to have extended functionality in Bitcoin that goes beyond this, but it will take quite some time to prove that it's safe and will be um, you know, not used in negative ways in the network. So that will pan out over time. But... For, for now, um, I think that this is like a very large and substantial chunk of software to work out how to use that later on can be patched to extend the functionality. So the way that it works right now, um, in the future, like we might be able to add things that get it closer and closer to what Ethereum implements and give Bitcoin um, users more and more power and sophistication. But I don't think that that means that we shouldn't do this right now because this gives Bitcoiners an immense amount of power over their funds. And, and I have four verticals that I think are really important. Um, decentralization, privacy, self-custody, and scalability. I think Sapio and Check Template Verify is an extremely critical part of that infrastructure in dramatically increasing all of those categories. Um, so that's why I, I think it's like a reasonable enough chunk to carve out. There are more ambitious chunks to carve out. What I think uh, Sapio and Check Template Verify specifically accomplish is punching very, very heavily above their weight for the amount of technical complexity they bring on. It's a very simple idea, very simple concept that allows you to do quite remarkable things. Yes, and let's get into Check Template Verify in a bit later. Uh, and I think right now there's still one interesting point to cover is that Zapio is, you know, it's out there. You can use it. And it did not require any major changes to the Bitcoin consensus rules. Now it can be improved with further consensus changes, but but ultimately they're they're not necessary. So t tell us a bit more why that is and where Zapio actually sits in, in the Bitcoin stack. Yeah, so there's essentially a trick that you can use where when you need a new opcode inside of a Bitcoin script, you can replace it with a set of keys. Um, for simplicity, let's just talk about it being a single key. If, if uh, you know, you're going to be doing this once Schnorr locks in, um, you know, you can have a federation that is built out for this emulation functionality. Um, and it would be opaque to the, uh, you know, the network, what you're actually using. So I think it's safe to um, basically, uh, you know, just think about a single key. So imagine that I replace an opcode with a key. And then whenever I want a signature from that key, I broadcast the transaction to it. And I say, please sign this transaction, but only if the transaction would be valid, if instead of a key, it were this opcode. Does that kind of make sense? So what we're doing is we're saying we are emulating the functionality of Check Template Verify with some server run by either you and a counterparty 
or some other agent in the network who's ensuring the correct execution. Aha, uh -huh, that's interesting. So you, you basically these these spending conditions are not verified by the Bitcoin full nodes per se. They verify what they see, right? And what they see is a regular public key and signature. Um, but the that public key and signature is not from the ultimate user who has his funds locked up, right? But he instead trusts this other third party who owns that private key or who, who, who knows that private key and who, who commits to, who promises to only sign with that private key if this, if this transaction verifies the spending conditions as if object template verify or any other opcode for that matter uh, is upheld. So here this, this uh, external node or cosigner, so to say, is to be trusted that he exec he verifies the uh, new opcode conditions. And if that trust is upheld and he only signs the transaction when the opcode is, is validated, and because other full nodes just verify the regular Bitcoin consensus, meaning check that signature, then it ends up being the same thing, right? That every full node verifies that signature, which means that the new opcode has been upheld. Yep, you, uh, you got it down to a T. That's really genius. That's that's quite cool. Um, is it, uh, like, it, w where's this used elsewhere? Yeah, so I, I don't think I can claim that I uniquely came up with this concept. Uh, maybe I came up with this explanation of it. Um, but an example where it's used today is uh, Blockstream's uh, Liquid sidechain, where if you remember back in the day, they were trying to do a trustless two-way peg but they ultimately couldn't come up with a sound way of getting that functionality into Bitcoin to validate another chain. And so as a result, uh, the peg mechanisms are done using a uh, custodial provider, essentially. And that means that those, those functionary nodes are essentially emulating if there were a way of actually validating the full sidechain data before, um, uh, before it was, you know, possible. I, I think where this is different is this is a conception of emulating functionality that is not technically out of reach for Bitcoin that we actually know how to do. We perfectly could have check template verify, you know, tomorrow in Bitcoin core. Um, if it were, you know, super necessary, uh, it's not complicated. There's not any unknown science to it, but there's an unknown consensus on if it's a good idea. Um, and so that's where this type of Oracle server can be a, a good substitute for something else. Um, and it, it's a general technique that I think could be used more broadly to drive feature development for Bitcoin is if you want a new opcode, well, set up a signing server and emulate the functionality. Yeah, that's very interesting. This is a very well permissionless <laughs> approach, right? Uh, I don't think that anyone could stop you from doing that. Um, Absolutely not. Of, yeah, of course, it just all hinges on on this one trust uh, yeah. facilitator. And who who do you want to trust? I personally don't really want to trust anyone. Um, mm -hmm. And as a result, I, I don't love this. I certainly also don't want to be the one running the signing server there's legal risk in running a signing server because you could be seen as, uh, let's say, a money transmitter. Um, so I don't want to be a money transmitter, so I don't want to run the signing server for people. Um, you could be you know, a target for hacking. Um, people could say, if I get this, I'm going to be able to steal all this Bitcoin, so I'm going to try and hack the server. Um, that's where you probably want it to be um, ultimately a uh, federation and you probably want some participants who are anonymous um, and nobody knows who they are and you can only talk to them through the Tor network. Um, you also might want to say that um, for any given protocol, uh, let's say, uh, you know, between you and I, well, we'll just both run an emulating server and we'll reset our emulator after the fact and reset which key it's using um, and then we'll delete that key. And so you could, you and a group of counterparties could form a contract uh, with a pretty simple, um, you know, signing server technology. Um, and then that would also work reasonably well. Um, so that, that's something that I think uh, there, there are different types of solutions that people might want to um, pursue for that. Um, that's something where the market can probably figure out what trust assumptions people are willing to do. 
But ultimately, my vibe is fuck trust assumptions, build the technology in the most decentralized way possible. So that, that that's how I want to drive things forward. And, and that's why I've been pushing for Chick Template Verify. Yeah, I see. Uh, but at the same time, you don't let yourself be stopped just if the technology does not exist in Bitcoin consensus rules. <laughs> uh, you find a genius way uh, to work around that uh, and you know provide further proof of concept that CTV is actually a good idea to, to follow down on. Yeah, and, and I think the really important part of it in the Sapio story is that it does mean that you can use Sapio today. Um, I was struggling to, ha to, to think about how can I advocate that anybody start building on Sapio? I, I mean, it requires technology that is uh, out there. I talked to one uh, very well-known venture capitalist uh, about how to fund this work. And the feedback I got from them was, our fund thesis says that any company that requires changes to Bitcoin Core to ultimately succeed is uninvestable. That fucking sucks. And mm -hmm. that's where... At that moment, I said, well, I need to make a part of the story for Sapio, how it can be used regardless of what happens in the rest of the network. And this provides a path for that. And now when I run a workshop, I can tell people, hey, look, there's a server in the cloud that I'm running that you could use if you want to and you're lazy. Otherwise, here is the command line program that you run in order to run your own server and connect it to your implementation of Sapio and have at it do whatever you want. So I've been able to run, uh, for example, congestion control trees on mainnet um, with no problem. And I have uh, somewhere in the cloud, um, a server that has a key. And I, uh, when I'm compiling my program, it calls out to that server and it establishes signatures for the transactions that I want to run. Um, the tooling is there for you to be able to define federations of participants. So you can define multi-sig federations as well. Um, and it, uh, you know, it works well enough. Um, so if you, if you do, did want to really use it today, there are a few key properties that you can't get that I think are also very important around non-interactivity. Um, those non-interactivity guarantees um, are amazing. Like they let you do some really crazy shit that I'm really pumped about. So without it, like, I think it is pretty like hampered, but if you just want to get the protocols going and you want to get proof of concepts online, and you're going to tell your users like, yeah, unfortunately you have to trust us for now, but here's, you know, like, uh, you know, like a 10 of 15, you know, thing that's going to be signing off or actually you can use unilateral, um, or, uh, maybe not unilateral. You can use, um, you can use unanimous consent federations. So you can use a, uh, you know, hundred of a hundred in the taproot world, uh, signing server. And as long as they're all online, um, when you're compiling your contract, then your contract will be compiled. And only if, you know, one, uh, only if 100 out of 100 want to cheat you, then you'll lose your thing. So maybe that's a good enough trust guarantee for getting some protocols off the ground. Um, I, I don't love that, but you know, Hey, it's a path forward and it's a way of adding new functionality to Bitcoin without, uh, consulting the rest of the network. Um, and once your new feature is widely adopted, you can say, Hey, we want to delete our federation, please replace it with an actual opcode. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. So let's get into some use cases, uh, or well, actually first let's define op CTV. What is this object template verify thing? Essentially object template verify is the ability to commit to a transaction inside of the Bitcoin script of a coin. So what you're saying is there, like when I go to unlock, um, this UTXO and spend it on the network. Um, I've provided more or less, uh, the TX ID of a specific transaction it can participate in. And if that TX ID matches the TX ID on the network, then that branch of the script will succeed. Um, we're using a slightly modified TX ID though. Um, the TX ID has certain pieces of information deleted from it in order to get around a hash cycle. Um, so it's a little bit modified. Um, but the effect is that if that branch of the script is taken, then there's only a single transaction that can inhabit the spending of that specific coin. Okay. That's very interesting. So the script of a single UTXO says exactly which in inside of which transaction ID it can be spent. 
and and that's that's interesting because um a transaction id can reference multiple things right there are different signature hash flags that can be mm -hmm. set and then for example all inputs are included or none right or or to some outputs or the amounts and such but so how do the um the, these hashing flags change the whole equation yeah so technically um ctv has kind of its own sig hash setting um and that setting is to hash everything that can change the txid except for the out point being spent um the the reason why we make this restriction is that check template verify should work even if there's nothing like uh, any prev out available uh, any prev out lets you do some pretty cool things uh, in the Lightning Network. It's also an upgrade coming to Bitcoin, uh, baby, if, if the community wants it. Um, but there are certain protocols where you might want to uh, pre-sign a transaction based on a specific uh, event that happens. And under that, you might need to know the exact TXID. And if you need to know the exact TXID, then you can rely on a chain of check template verify covenants not modifying the txid at the end of it if there is a single input along that entire flow if there are multiple inputs then because we don't bind the um the actual out point well then somebody could change the you know change your thing and they could change it without your permission so that's where um there's a little bit of an edge but there's a set of sort of well-defined uh, check template verify programs uh, that use a single input per step. And those ones, it is impossible for a third party to modify the TXID. Therefore, you can depend on that TXID for, um, for example, like an HTLC. Uh -huh. Yeah, I see. Um, and I mean, there come a bunch of like edge cases to mind. Like, for example, what if there are two separate UTXOs and yeah. Each of them have in their spending conditions a object template verify with different transaction IDs, right? But I mean, there can be a double spend in the in that commitment transaction, um, if, if you yeah. get what I mean, right? That that both of them, both of these transactions that are referenced, could spend the same coins kind of twice. Yeah, um, that, that's that's a that's a great question. Um, I call that the half spend problem. So. There are interesting yeah, things. That's a good name. <laughs> there are interesting things you can do with it. Um, like if if you wanted to program with it, you know, there are kind of cool things you can do when it's intentional. Like let's say I had two coins, both for 0.5 Bitcoin. They both have the same covenant, um, and they, the covenant says one Bitcoin comes out. So then you really have to find another person who's willing to, uh, you know, fill the rest of the funds. But there's sort of this edge, which is well, what if they both have one Bitcoin? They, then they, it's a one Bitcoin transaction fee. How do we preclude that from happening? Uh, the choice that I made in defining check template verify is that the input uh, or, or the hash commits to the index that the covenant is being executed on. And so if you have two covenants um, and they're both saying that they've got to be at index zero, then they can't be spent in the same transaction unless you specified that this coin can be spent at index zero or index one. And then in the other one, you said index zero or index one, then they would be able to switch places if you wanted to. Uh -huh. So so you can have that or condition though? Yeah. But where's so, that in the Bitcoin script? Yeah, so in the Bitcoin script, and this is sort of like, how do you actually use check template verify in a real program? Um, I think it's a little bit easier to imagine this in a taproot world, world where you have a tree of possible possibilities. Imagine each leaf of that tree says a different transaction. Uh -huh. Yeah. And of course, when you spend that coin, you must commit to one of these leaves. And, and then therefore yep. you, you end up with only one transaction. Yep, exactly. Okay. That's fascinating. Uh, so now that we got a bit into how check template verify works, uh, what are the cool things that we can do with it? And one thing you already mentioned is congestion control. So what's that all about? Yeah. So if you go back and watch, I think it's like my like BPACE 2017 or something talk. Um, that's the Stanford conference. It's now the Stanford blockchain conference. Um, I talk about this idea of congestion control and where I originally motivated it was I said, closing a lightning channel can be expensive if you have a lot of HTLCs. Um, what if you were able to close the channel 
and commit to the closing state, but then at a later block, actually create all of the UTXOs needed to close the channel properly. Um, that would give you a benefit in terms of being able to close even in times of high fee, and then just extract the HTLCs that are contentious or could fail. Uh, it's sort of a powerful idea that you're able to have a protocol and then choose which bits of state you're unrolling at any given time in order to respond to high fees on the network. This, this is, uh, you know, actually, I think pretty important. Um, that was the original idea behind congestion. And I tried to do it a few different ways. The um, first way that I tried to do it was I said, okay, well, what if we just had covenants? People said, ah, covenants are too powerful. And then I said, okay, what if we tried to uh, have just emulator servers? And people said, well, just emulator servers are, you know, too interactive and too trustful. And you're talking about ECDSA and no one wants that. And I said, okay, what if I design this like minimal opcode and uh, then it is really only trying to accomplish a very limited set of things. Um, and we'll see what else we can do with it. And I, that's how I came up with Check Template Verify in the first place. I presented it in May 2019 at Bitcoin Devs in San Francisco. And then there was a reasonably positive response to it at that uh, event. Um, it's Chatham House rules, so I can't say exactly who was happy about it. But people gave me good feedback that this is sort of in a reasonable direction. Um, but there are a few things I had to fix with it. But the idea of the congestion control tree is relatively simple. Um, rather than getting into the nitty gritty of like a lightning uh, implementation and how you'd have all the rules to do it there, I envisioned a world where an exchange wanted to pay out like 100,000 users in a single block. And they did not have the ability to pay the fee rate that was currently prevailing. Um, because there's a lot of chain demand. It's like, a, let's say it's a run on all of the exchanges. It's proof of keys day and everybody's putting their funds on their ledger Dano and then, you know, putting them back uh, on the exchange the next day when they want to trade. So that was sort of the idea that I had in mind. How, how can I pay everybody all at once when maybe there's not even enough block space to cover a batch with all of those participants? It would have to go over multiple. Can we come up with something that would allow us to settle essentially an unlimited number of payouts at a time. And what I came up with was a tree of transactions. Um, so at the top level, you have a single output that receives, let's say, 100 Bitcoin. And then it does a transaction that splits that UTXO into four pieces. And then each of those four pieces splits into four pieces. And each of those four pieces splits into four pieces. And you can kind of see this branching structure of these transactions. And then way down at the bottom, you would have uh, individual leaves. And those individual leaves would be payments to specific addresses. So that's the idea of a congestion control tree is that in order to confirm payments to everybody, all you have to do is create that single output. You just create that and that spawns a tree. In order for somebody to verify that they have funds in that tree, then all you have to do is all you have to do is check that Merkle proof that there's a series of transactions you could broadcast that would get you funds. And so you check that and you verify that it's true. And then when you want to redeem funds for yourself, uh, all you have to do is broadcast that to the network. And the, the length of that, this is where it's really important. And let's say you have 100,000 people and it branches with a factor of four. Uh, how many transactions would you have to broadcast? And keep in mind, these transactions are one input, four outputs. So these aren't huge transactions. How many would you have to broadcast in order for anybody to be able to claim out their funds? It turns out the first person would have to broadcast eight transactions. That's really not that bad, right? So you're talking about eight transactions. Each one um, is relatively small. And then you can get your individualized coin out. So if somebody really needed their money immediately, it wouldn't be that much work for them to be able to get it. How much would the next person need? This is a powerful idea called amortization. Each subsequent withdrawal reduces the amount of work that has to be done for another group of that network. So if the first person does one transaction that expands out to the, the top level four people, 
then the next subsequent person doesn't have to do that first transaction because somebody else already did it. So the next person only has to do seven. And then it sort of splits. So there's, there's after one person does the top eight transaction, then three of the participants have to do seven. And then down that tree, um, then three of the participants have to do six, so on and so forth. And the total overall work for the entire network is essentially constant. Um, that it is a factor of with uh, a branching factor of four, I think it's like 25% more transactions than if it were individualized or 25% more block space. And so you get this decongesting effect where you can wait to do those transactions until there's a low fee period. And it puts a back pressure on the network as well, because why would you want to pay transaction fees for something that's not urgent when you can just wait for somebody else to do it if they're more urgent than you? So it puts a back pressure that people are incentivized to wait longer for somebody else to pay the transaction fee for you. So I thought this was a really good mechanism that could be an important part of Bitcoin in the future, where this congestion control would help suppress uh, volatility in the mempool and give people full confirmation while making them wait for redemptions. Yeah, that's that's fascinating on so many levels. Uh, and one thing to point out is that even though the relative fee rate, so to say, can be meddled with here, right? So that when the fees are currently high, you just publish that commitment output, so to say. Uh, and then later when the fees are low, you publish the rest of the transactions. However, yeah. the issue is that the the total transaction size in, in virtual bytes of such a tree structure is much larger than if there were only one transaction making all these payouts, right? The same reasoning as transaction batching, just alone for having the uh, the transaction headers, right? That alone UTXO size growth and such. Um, so yeah. where do you think that that trade-off between higher total size, but potentially less relative fee rate, where's that pressure here? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And there are some interesting design uh, spaces around this. One thing that I designed uh, CTV around was compressibility. This can't happen in consensus, but it can happen um, on broadcast layers or on other layers, which is that in order to um, verify a payout through this congestion control trade mechanism, you actually only need like the Merkle leaves of that lookup path and the transactions themselves, because they might be deterministic, those can be basically pruned because uh, you know exactly how the transaction rolls forward. Um, so there's, there's some amount of pruning that can happen because it's deterministic function computed on the leaves. So just given the leaves, you're actually able to prune out a lot of that state. That, that's pretty complicated. And I think that that's like something that would happen in like, you know, decades from now that people would do this as an archival thing. They would identify this pattern and they would prune out the state that you don't need. Um, but the, the, the more general question is like, does this actually improve things and, or how much worse does it make it? Um, and ultimately there's not a single answer because there are multiple scenarios where it can be more or less beneficial. One thing that I would, uh, you know, give as an example, what if instead of this tree structure, what if I just have a single hop, let's say I'm paying a hundred people and then I have a single compressed transaction and then a single expand transaction, I can give those 100 people full confirmation, right? Where everybody um, sees that that single output guarantees that there's, a, there's an expansion that pays out to, to all 100. Um, and the total overhead is insanely small, right? It's one transaction divided by 100 outputs. So it's a really negligible amount of overhead for the entire thing. But now when fees are really high, I can get all of those things confirmed um, and then wait until fees go down and actually save a pretty amount, amount of money on the fees. And I'm using just negligibly more block space. So I think you can, and basically by increasing that number of what the radix is, whether it's four or a hundred or a thousand, you can get that amount of overhead arbitrarily small. The other side of this is that the overhead is a constant factor. It is not a asymptotic factor. It's just basically if there are n people getting paid, it is k times more than if you just did the naive batch. 
Like it could be log n, for example. Like because it's a tree, you might think that it would be like n log n, but it's actually just a constant factor. So it's, it's not as bad as, as you might think. The other side of it, and this is like a very niche thing, is that I kind of uh, roughly proved in a simulation that for batching, if you know that you have different customers who have different levels of priority, batching is irrational. The logic behind this is that let's assume that I have tier one customers and tier two customers. Tier one customers want transactions confirmed in the next block. Tier two customers want transactions confirmed in the next week. Is it rational for me to put them in the same batch? It is not because for that block space consumption, I have to pay the highest fee rate any of the customers needs for that batch. So naturally as a business, when I have different priorities for outgoing payments, I will need to split them into two distinct batches. Now, here's the niche property that I proved, which is that if you want to pay out to multiple batches with different fee priorities, check template verify ultimately allows you to do that from a single output. And that reduces the total amount of bytes that you are using for the protocol because it reduces the amount of signatures and transactions that you have to do. So overall, even though you are seemingly using more block space, what I proved is under rational circumstances, you might already become a larger consumer of block space and check template verify allows you to utilize that space more efficiently. Yeah, that is really interesting. And because in this OPSI TV, if you have this tree structure, right, how many transactions you individually have to make to get that final settlement depends on how many of your local peers in the tree kind of already made other transactions, right? Um, and then here, so, so you might even be able to, when you construct this first commitment output, to order the, the time preference of the receivers so that they get to be localized as well. Does Absolutely. that make sense? Yep. Um, and there is, and, and I wrote code for this at some point that I could have revived. There are a lot of different types of programs that you might want to optimize around. One is, let's say that I um, know the priorities of my users, but they're not paying me extra for service. So I'm not going to give them priority position. Uh, you know, there's like priority boarding on an airplane. I might want to smear around everybody and guarantee that there's one high priority person in each bucket so that there is maximal um, sort of dispersion of people willing to drive the entire tree to progress. Um, or I might want to bucket people who are of similar priority together and say, well, I've got you know four high priority users, let's bucket them together because then they'll share and they'll amplify each other's priority. Um, so there are different ways that I can do that depending on what my incentive as the payer is or what my clients expect. Um, I don't know, I haven't proven like what is optimal or you know perfect, but there are definitely different design spaces in how you uh, sort the users into the tree. Yeah, fascinating. And I think a lot of uh, yeah, pro um, optimizations can be done with this. Absolutely. That, uh, yeah, fascinating. And um, now- it, it, I guess the, the one addition that I would add on to that is that there's also a notion of like how big should the uh, should each uh, node in that tree be? Because then there's a question of like how much individual culpability does each entity have? So if you did like the the branching factor is like 100,000, then for the first person who wants to get out, it's just going to be ridiculously expensive. And so I actually proved that uh, radix of four is optimal as a uh, balance of the amount of block space required by any individual is optimized at rate X4, that they have the minimum amount of extra shit they're paying for. Uh-huh, that's, yeah, that's interesting. But, but still, how much uh, are, is the average using paying extra for the scheme? Uh, I mean, it's difficult to say, right? Because some users will pay much more while some users will pay almost nothing. Yeah, and I guess the question is paying more than what? Um, so one example, and maybe this makes sense to get more practically applied for uh, Wasabi. Um, let's say that this is done in a coin join. This makes coin joins really freaking cheap to do, right? And there's, there's a trade-off, which is that now you're going to leak some information about priority. 
because it's it goes into a tree and whoever comes out first like obviously had some more priority around it but they're now essentially really cheap to do um just to do the join itself is o of inputs um plus one output rather than being o of inputs plus outputs desired so join protocols can get a lot cheaper in terms of spot demand and here's the question. Let's say that you are a high priority user trying to mix with low priority um, participants. Then when you go to child pays for parent out of your thing, you have to child pays for parent bump the entire O of N coin join. So it's a lot more expensive for you because you're going to be creating everybody else's outputs. And so uh, under that model, it's cheaper for you because now you're just paying for your lookup path, which is log N. So you're paying actually quite a bit less in this model um, for a larger coin join, which gives you more anonymity, even though you're leaking that you were a priority user. So there is actually, for a lot of users, I, I think that this type of technology can decrease fees, um, even though the overall aggregate fee revenue for miners would go up. It's sort of like a weird uh, mirage. For users that are low priority, they're also not paying more because they're just uh, waiting. So there's sort of, it's sort of interesting, like more money is coming out, but it's not really clear exactly who it's coming from because everybody independently, uh, you know, feels like they're getting a slightly better deal. Um, it's sort of like in the middle, people are paying a little bit more in that uh, integral over all users produces more block space and more fee revenue, but also a healthier mempool backlog because there are more things that are, you have sort of the, that infinite backlog at zero. Um, where you know, have a lot more people who have full confirmation, but when fees are low, they're going to be more aggressive about trying to fill, fill that space. So I think that that's also a positive effect for the network. Um, the, the other impact where it causes uh, less fees to be spent is er under replaced by fee. If you imagine that you have a batch with, um, let's say, 100 outputs, and then you replace it, um, you have to pay higher uh, absolute fee and higher fee rate in order for your transaction to go through. And that means that it's very expensive to replace uh, something with a lot of outputs. Um, whereas with um, Check Template Verify, these protocols where you're paying a lot of people and you're doing replace by fee, now you're only replacing a single output. And so you're paying a lot less per uh, incremental transaction. So replace by fee protocols also get uh, a lot cheaper. Yes, but replace by fee also changes the transaction ID, right? So that will mess up the, the script itself. Or ah. maybe in to, to more generally replaced, how do you actually pay for fees in this? And do you need to figure out the fees at the time where you create the commitment output? Yeah, so those are two very separate questions. Um, so that's, um, let's start with um, like the first one, which is replaced by B changes the transaction. Um, it changes the transaction, but we're talking about the initialization of the protocol. So what we're comparing is, uh, let's say a coin join where you uh, pay out to a hundred people, right? And it's a single transaction to a payout to create a tree that pays out to a hundred people. So you're, you're, you're not changing the, um, like, and in, in then let's say you're adding one more person in or something like that. So with Check Template Verify, you change the output script, right? So you're actually paying into a different protocol because you're adding a new user. And then with um, the sort of uh, online batching protocols, um, you end up paying quadratically for fees because you, you have N people and then um, you add one more, you add you know N more over time and then you're paying N times N in terms of each transaction where you add people. So that's sort of the, the, the comparison and the... Um, the TXID changing in this case, because it's not a part of CTB and the inputs being spent, you're not violating the property that I gave you earlier, because this is in the input space of something that was not previously in Check Template Verify. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see. Um, and then in terms of the, the fees, um, that is one thing that's a little bit unfortunate is that you cannot modify the fee rate um, asterisk. Uh, there, there are a few cases where you can. With Check Template Verify, you're locked in with whatever you initially set. Um, this means that Check Template Verify generally assumes that you're going to drive progress using Child Pays for Parent. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, and Child Pays for Parent has issues. Um, for example, pinning is an issue. Um, so you can, you can get stuck. Um, I've been working over the last uh, year or two on how to fix the mempool to provide... Um, uh, 
a non dossable interface for check template verify contracts. Um, I, I, unfortunately, like that's been progressing pretty slowly. I have a lot of ideas. Um, you can special case some types of check template verify contract because uh, you can bundle them together. Um, so there are some properties that if you have a well-formed check template verified tree, you can compress them into a single mempool entry. Um, that's pretty sophisticated to do in the software. So that's not really proposed right now. Um, uh, there are also some proposals that I have around um, this uh, sponsors uh, opcode that would allow you to make an independent transaction that drives progress forward for an arbitrary other protocol. Um, I think conceptually it's, it's a good idea, but it's a long way for that actually being possible. Um, so th there are some issues. Um, what I can say anecdotally is like, I did a um, check template verify tree um, using Sapio and uh, emulation um, on mainnet. And what happened is the initial transaction or two went through and the rest got stuck. And then, uh, you know, a few weeks later, um, there was that period where there was like one sat per V byte or something, and then they all cleared. So it does, it does work conceptually. Wallets uh, know to like rebroadcast their stuff on some frequency. So it does kind of work in the current architecture for this stuff. But yeah, paying fees is a little bit uh, problematic if CPFP is not reliable. Yes, and, and to add on top of that, again, CP uh, child pays for parents increases the total transaction size, right? and therefore also the, the fee burden. Um, uh, it, and... it, 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 it doesn't. Um, it does if you're talking about anchor outputs. Um, so anchor outputs would increase the total overhead. Um, my guess is that if you added anchor outputs at each branch um, with like an opt true so that anybody can spend it however they want, um, it would probably bias the optimal radix towards like five or six for the for the branching factor. Um, but the actual overall overhead of that is still constant because the number of leaves, a number of nodes in the tree is a constant, um, uh, you know, factor more than the number of uh, le total leaves. And so the overhead is still not uh, super substantial. Um, the uh, other side of it is that if you are able to broadcast to your leaf, then you don't need any anchor outputs in your protocol. And it's not, um, you don't CPFP to get progress because you're already fully confirmed. You only CPFP when you're going to spend. So it's kind of like uh, when you're going to try and make a new payment, you, you, don't, you have no need to try to CPFP just to confirm funds. And this is in contrast to the existing status quo where when somebody pays you oh, and it's not enough so to go through, right? Then you're not fully confirmed. So you actually rationally will CPFP up until like, um, let's say you're getting paid by somebody who you have no idea why they're paying you, they're just sending you money. Um, you will rationally CPFP up until only earning one Satoshi out of that transaction because otherwise they can just double spend you. Whereas with um, CTV congestion trees, you know that you're fully confirmed, so you're not anxious. And there's also another uh, reason that I can get into, which gets into sort of like another use case, which is uh, the Lightning Network is that actually you can get paid into a non-interactively constructed payment channel between you and another counterparty. And so you might not even need to ever expand until somebody else does, as long as you're able to uh, operate that payment channel. So you can immediately, even though the UTXO is not fully confirmed, you can immediately use it as a fully functional payment channel. Oh yeah, that's, that's also interesting. Right, because the, the funds is quote unquote virtually committed to in the blockchain in this commitment output. And right? yeah. even though the actual channel output is not yet there, um, in theory you can have it. But so yes, you can open this channel, but what if you would, for example, want to close it again? Yeah, then so you need we... to fill up the tree and make the progress until the actual UTXO comes out and then also uh, close that channel in a follow-up transaction. Correct. Um, and in that case, it is uh, like logarithmic um, growth. So, uh, you know, may maybe like an interesting exercise to do is why don't you tell me a total number of transactions that it's acceptable in the worst case for somebody to experience? Just pick a number. The total number of transactions before you g actually get your, get the, yeah. the coin on the chain, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just pick a number. Like, let's say, let's say it's, you know, eight. like eight, eight is the number that, well, that's yeah. the number from earlier. So that's easy. That means that you can pay in a batch, a hundred thousand people. And the worst case person is going to have to do eight transactions in order to get their payment channel removed completely. Um, 
It's actually a little bit better than that because um, each payment channel has two parties. So two people got paid. So really that number is 200,000. Uh -huh, so yeah. is pay if, if paying 200,000 people in worst case, you have to do eight transactions that are size uh, four outputs each in single input. Um, so essentially that, that I think that that comes out to like, uh, like something like 250 bytes. Um, I could be a little bit off on the math. So what you're talking about is, um, worst case you have to do, um, like, uh, 2000, uh, bytes into the network, um, in order to get your payment channel, uh, opened fully. Yeah. But again, like in the meantime, I can already send and receive payments, right? Uh, yep. So you don't have to open it until you until you have to um, cooperatively uh, or uncooperatively close that channel, right? As long as you can, as but, long as you're cooperating, you don't need to close it. Yeah, exactly. And then, but then, how how about those timeouts, right? Uh, uh, when do the timeouts in Lightning actually kick in? Because the, well, the token is not yet there. Yeah. So the timeouts can all be done relatively. So they, they don't start until uh, you actually open the channel. Uh huh. And since it's not open, at least not directly on the blockchain, yeah. although it's committed to open on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So then you cannot do uncooperative closes in that time, right? Um, so yeah, it would, um, so the protocol for doing it is essentially, um, you have a channel that is a, I have a diagram of this that uh, maybe you can put in the show notes. So in order to do a non-interactive channel, essentially you move a coin to an address that has two possibilities. One is you uh, cooperative close, so two of two signature, um, or there is a check template verify that sends it to some transaction B where that transaction B creates an output that can close either two of two cooperative or uh, CTV with some transaction C. Um, transaction C has a relative time lock that says that it takes two weeks uh, from the creation of B uh, in order for that to be able to be broadcast on the network. Um, the other two of two is used for your channel updates. Um, and so essentially what that looks like uh, overall is that when you uh, create this channel um, in the tree, it is sort of in this uh, nascent state where you're able to sign all of your... Um, like channel updates and uh, payments back and forth with your counterparty, but there's nothing that um, can be broadcast to the network immediately. And it's only once the channel is fully expanded out to the network that the timer starts for that, um, that uncooperative close. And here's where the really important property is. The uncooperative close, that timer only starts once one of the parties claims that they're starting an uncooperative close. So it's not like once the channel is expanded out, then, uh, you know, like, oh no, now the clock automatically starts ticking. It's once one of the counterparties claims that they're doing an uncooperative close, then the two-week timer starts. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And again, it removes that main issue that you're still waiting for a long time to actually get that coin on the blockchain, which you can spend alone, right? Well, but yeah, if you have cause... a lightning channel, you just pay away instantly. Cause you can, you can immediately start using it. Um, and this is where, like, uh, if you'll let me get like super excited there, this is where like things start getting really cool. Um, one thing is imagine that you want to do this from a coin join protocol. Um, well now in that coin join, you can have everybody creating, uh, lightning channels and you can do it in a way that doesn't, uh, like reveal that you're doing a channel setup because all you have to do is create an address that uh, uh, maps into one of these non-interactive channel setups. Um, and then it's uh, essentially insured. And with Taproot, um, if you cooperate to close, then nobody finds out that you have even had a channel hiding under there. Um, so in the non-interactivity means as long as the correct amount of money goes to that address, like you've successfully created a channel. Um, that's really powerful. Um, the other point that makes this like really exciting is imagine that you participate in coin joins regularly um, and you have a number of channels. Well, what you can do is you can essentially swap channel by channel in order to get um, all of your funds available only in a single, um, a single redemption. So let's say that I had like N pay payment channels. Um, 
let's, let's, let's just use two actually for uh, simplicity. Let's say I've got two payment channels. What I can do is I can route all the funds so that I saturate on one of those payouts. So then rather having to redeem two different branches out of a tree to get my money out, I can uh, saturate one of my channels and then I can just redeem um, my funds in a single payout. Now imagine I have N payment channels. Now, depending on how much liquidity I have in each of them, I can try to saturate one of the links and then claim out a single one. This is a really, really powerful concept where by deferring the creation of these outputs, I actually have an opportunity to reduce the total amount of chain work that I'm doing. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. I mean, I I think the the possible use cases for this are well quite large, but aren't doesn't that kind of make you afraid too, right? Because there's so many things possible. How do you know that there is not some edge case that is actually very dangerous here? Uh, yeah, I mean that is a great question. Um, the answer is basically uh, fewfold. One is that check template verify is already very easy to emulate with a signing server. So the only thing that we're changing with check template verify is a trust assumption. Th does that make sense as to why, like, if you were worried about what can check template verify do, it's really nothing that can't already be done by having a signing server. So what's the problem? Yeah, um, but I, well, I guess that's somewhat of a very general counter argument, right? Because a it, lot of it, things it, are possible with signing servers. Yeah. So let, let me give you why this in particular is not concerning. Check template verify. All it does is check a hash. It is O of one work. Um, the hashing uh, algorithm that I chose um, does caching so that even if you had a, a million check template verify opcodes in a row, it's not going to cause that much additional hashing to happen. There's no quadratic hashing attack. Um, outside of that, there's not much else that can happen. It's not like it can accidentally take um, like, uh, you know, like quadratic or exponential runtime to validate. It's really a simple hash check. So there would have to be a lot of other things broken in Bitcoin if check template verify were to be broken <laughs> in that way. Like we, we probably would yeah. have a lot of other vulnerabilities in how we're doing hash computation currently. Yeah, um, I see. Right. So, so it, it's yet another very simple building block. And then because it's such a simple building block, a lot of things can be done with it. Uh, and that's both reassuring, right? Because the actual building block is quite simple, but still scary because so many things are possible. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's where, um, like it's both exciting and scary that you're absolutely right. Like Sapio was built specifically kind of as an answer to a challenge. Like I had all of these ideas in my head and a lot more actually. We've mostly been talking about uh, like privacy and scalability. There's also self-custody and decentralization that there are really important applications too. But I had all these ideas like spec'd out. You can see on the utxos.org website, all these different use cases. And uh, a lot of people didn't actually believe me. They're like, yeah, you're just saying that it solves everything, but like, where's the actual running code for these things? And as I tried to build out these applications to show people, I realized I was writing the same thing again and again. And so then that's why I made Sapio. I said, look, there's general purpose tooling that can be built in order to uh, show people how to build it, but actually make working applications um, for any of these use cases. And Sapio kind of crossed that chasm of like, oh shit, you can actually do a ton of experimentation on this platform and you can, um, you can build really incredible things. Um, so yeah, it, it is, uh, it is exciting. It is scary. I would say that if this scares you, you should be just as scared as Sapio with mainnet and signing servers as you should with check template verify rolled out. Cause like it or not, this stuff is here. Yeah. The, the beauty and bane of permissionless, <laughs> the nature of Bitcoin. Exactly. I mean, uh, try to stop me. You can't. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, this is this is fascinating. So, uh, just to just to confirm, are there any other interesting use cases for object template verify in the coin join example, or is it just again that congestion control? I think that it's mostly congestion control. I I won't say there's not other things that are cool too, um, but none of them uh, immediately come to mind. Um, so I think that that's probably fine. The congestion control is, you know, making it cheaper and more cost-effective, no matter what the prevailing fee rate is to do a coin join when you need one. 
I, I think that that's probably the main sell. Yes, the, uh, the, yeah, that's true. And again, uh, one of the biggest downsides of CoinJoin is its large on-chain footprint. Uh, and to be able to reduce that burden, especially for some relative uh, percentage of users who have that high time preference, it's extremely interesting. I yeah. would just have to do a lot more thinking on how the actual privacy of uh, the privacy threat model changes when you split up users into different batches of withdrawal priorities. And especially what if they remix, right? So so what if yeah. if you wait a couple and, and then eventually your spending transaction is actually a remix and a new coin join? Um, lots of nuances here. Yeah, so that actually brings up uh, two sort of interesting points. Uh, the first is, yeah, privacy. It, it's worth very careful consideration before doing this. Um, there are ways that you can still benefit from the congestion control that do not affect privacy. My hunch is that Spending priority is something that coin joins already leak because you can already see who spends first. So I, I don't think that there is fundamentally new information that is leaked. It just seems like there is new information that's leaked because like really there's like a, a, a bigger difference on chain, but I think it's already information that's leaked. The other side of that is, well, what if somebody remixes into another uh, protocol? Um, that's something that is a general purpose thing that's kind of cool in Check Template Verify with Sapio is that there's a certain point where I think I said in the metaphor at the beginning that uh, you're filling up these cups with water and eventually you take the cup off the table, right? And you've got a cup of water and what you do with that is your business. Sapio does have tooling that helps you express what should happen with that water. Um, and so what you can say is you can say, Hey, look, this is a glass of water. You can really do whatever you want with it, but we highly recommend putting it back into the same protocol again, or into some other protocol. Uh, an example of this would be, imagine I express in Sapio a federated side chain and ultimately the federated side chain allows for some set of signers to remove funds from the protocol. Um, Sapio can help you express that you receive a request from a user, you validate it against your database that it's a valid request, you update your database, and then the remaining funds go back into the federation. Sapio can express that logic of what should happen. So if you are a coin joiner and you are saying that, look, I'm just a market participant, um, Sapio can help you express that logic of you receive funds out and then you put them into a new coin join again later. Um, so that, that's something that you wouldn't be locked into that, but you can get help writing the logic that makes your, um, coin join market making bot, um, run. And, and again, right. When, as soon as we have channel openings in uh, coin joins, I think then that shows even more the power of the, uh, congestion control of coin joins with non-interactive channels being opened. Th th that's shaping up to be very complex and interesting. And I'm sure we can build a bunch of fascinating things with it. Yeah. And, and I think one of the main things that I really like about the non-interactive payment channels inside of congestion control trees is that like the non-interactive channels themselves are a standalone interesting protocol, even outside mm -hmm. of a, uh, you know, congestion control tree. It's kind of cool that if your keys are offline, I can initialize a channel for the both of us. Like that's actually pretty innovative, um, just alone. Cause right now we both have to have a key online, right. To sign off on the recovery path. Um, CTV gets rid of that and Sapio makes it easy to write the code that expresses that logic. What's also very neat about that is you can initialize channels into arbitrary sub protocols. So that's a little bit of a mind bender, but imagine that I initialize a channel with uh, a federation. And then if the channel, let's like, say it's a multi-party federation with like a hundred people and one person is paying into it. Um, to initialize it, or maybe it's constructively built kind of like uh, within anyone can pay until you have enough funds. So anybody can pay until there's enough funds. We don't care who's providing which input, but the, the uh, and it opens up a payment channel between all of us, but then the, the contested case, um, which any of us can initiate, pays into a congestion control tree, right? So you've nested the protocols inside of one another. And imagine you come up with a DeFi protocol based on Sapio. Well, you could open up, for example, an option contract as the initial closing state of your contract. 
So you could have some Oracle protocol, which says, you know, based on the price of gold, you get a certain amount of Bitcoin. And that could be the initialization of the payment channel. So you can, you can put arbitrary things inside of ar other arbitrary things. Sapio makes it really simple to be able to express that general purpose logic of the um, default closing case of a channel might be some other protocol that I'm interested in, and I can make it in a non-interactive manner. Yeah, N nesting things, turtles all the way down. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure this is going to somehow break the universe, but well, uh, <laughs> so far, so far it still works. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's 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 fascinating magic that you're building on, uh, and, and, and we mentioned. Yeah, I, I was just curious if if there are any big broad topics that we have not yet spoken about that you would like to mention about all of these conversations. Um, yeah, well, I think to just put a specific uh, keyword to that concept I just introduced, it's composability. It's a major topic in Sapio, which is how do we reuse effort? It's sort of the entire reason for Sapio existing is you can make all these protocols as one-off things, but how do we reuse effort? And as we reuse effort, how do we make things that can integrate with one another? That's something that's still uh, developing and expanding um, what that means, but it's really important for Sapio because what I want is to be able to develop standard purpose contracts, for example, non-interactive channels or uh, wallet vaults or anything else for that matter, where you are able to um, take components that exist and, and, and pick and choose and compose. That's something that Ethereum and Solidity are kind of magical around, is that you can compose things pretty, pretty neatly. Like, let's say that um, I have a... Uh, like special purpose governing DAO that is holding some Ethereum. And then I want to deposit that Ethereum into, um, you know, Uniswap with some other token that we have. Like all of that just kind of works, even though Uniswap had no idea at the time that they wrote it that you might want to do this thing in the future um, with this weird DAO. Um, I really want to see uh, the ability for me as like a wallet developer to say, hey, look, you know, we developed out this uh, wallet vault application and you can pick your own cold storage application. And the, you just seamlessly plug in your cold storage application and it knows how to message pass between one another to construct the entire protocol and everything kind of just works. That's a level of magic that I think is in reach right now, but it requires a, a development of these types of standard components and frameworks um, at, at a layer up. And so that's something that I'm really excited about is that composability, because I think that that's the point where people can really start uh, building, you know, the, the money Legos world where you're not on the hook for every little bit of the protocol you're building. You're just on the hook for the unique magic that you've developed. Yeah. And this is again, very similar in the vision to Miniscript, right? To, to have these building blocks that are modular and that work well with each other. Uh, that that's a nice vision. Uh, and mm -hmm. m maybe along that line, uh, this is also quite similar to the Rust ecosystem, right? Great modularity and, and composability. Uh, maybe go a bit more into these details, why you chose Rust as a programming language for Sapio. Yeah, so originally when I made the prototype of Sapio, I, I did it inside of Python. Um, and the architecture of it is basically the same as the current Rust implementation. And that was because I had this concept of like, I want it to be really simple to deploy. Um, it should be an environment that everybody already has on their computer. Um, and uh, I, I want things to be very easy for developers to get a hold of. And I kind of hit like a Tower of Babel moment where the Python code was getting just hideously complicated and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't fast. Um, and changing things. It was really hard to detect how changes in one part of the code affected another part of the code. And I felt like it wasn't yet collapsed, but it was imminently going to hit complexity collapse. And I would make something that was not secure and would result in people losing funds. And so I took a couple months to um, re-implement everything in Rust. Um, and that was challenging in part because um, you know, getting the uh, exact match for the behavior that I built out in Python um, was pretty difficult. It was a little bit sad because going from uh, Python to Rust means that like you're adding another like compiler pass into the mix. Like now you've got to compile these programs, whereas previously you could just run them. Um, so that's a little bit less user friendly. Um, and Rust is like not as widely adopted in the world as Python is. So I felt like I was going to be cutting out some users. 
But what I felt is that for the type of users who want to develop and deploy Bitcoin smart contracts, learning Rust is a pretty small obstacle to overcome. Um, and ultimately it will make the writing and development of these contracts much easier because you'll be automatically insulated from different types of uh, issue. Um, and I don't mean like the memory safety because ultimately for a lot of them, memory safety is not like terribly important because you can run them in their own module and just like pass the arguments to. But the, uh, the reason why Rust helps is the type system is really sophisticated. So when you're working on a state machine, uh, Rust has type level uh, state machines that you can do that ensure that your uh, state transitions are valid at comp comp compilation time. So that, that was like a really uh, powerful tool and I used that pretty heavily. So being in Rust, uh, I think was really good in, in terms of not being a standalone language. Um, I wanted people to be able to benefit from all the tools available in the Rust ecosystem and to be able to deeply integrate CPO contracts into Rust applications. And so that was a, also a natural choice. If I had made my own standalone language, um, kind of like how, how Miniscript is in a sense, um, where, you know, like, okay, well you pass like a string of stuff to a Rust Miniscript compiler and it gives you a result back. Um, that felt like it would make, um, the things that you can express inside of Sapio too limited. For example, in Miniscript, I can't write that, um, like a public key should, should be, um, downloaded from the network. So I can't write inside of Rust Miniscript, like, Hey, download this key from the network. Um, you, you actually can do something like that. There's like an API for like translating keys from one, from one key language to another key language that in theory, um, could work for functionality like this, but it's not like, like Miniscript is not like a general purpose, uh, programming language. So you can't do, you know, you can't do loops, for example, you can't say, um, you know, do some computation to determine the structure of this thing. Whereas in Sapio, because we have a full fledged Rust programming language, you can express all of these concepts and you can, um, you know, run any Turing complete optimizer, for example, that you want that downloads things from the network that, um, uh, you know, solves some hard problem. Um, and then outputs at the end of the thing, a certificate of the fully compiled program. So that sort of, uh, gives you a lot of power and because of how, um, Sapio is defined to produce a static artifact of pipes, right? I said earlier, that's like a fixed, uh, you know, set of pathways. You always, uh, either finish compiling or don't finish compiling. And if you finish compiling, you have a complete analyzable artifact of all possible state transitions. Yeah, I see. Absolutely fascinating. So if wallet developers would like to look into Sapio and what's possible with it, uh, where do they go? The best resource is learn.sapio-lang.org. I put a book together that is sort of a interactive tutorial where you can, um, you know, see how Sapio works, read about the library's structure, how the compiler works, what's possible, what's not possible, and then do some exercises, uh, that should, uh, challenge you to think about, uh, how to use Sapio. There's also, um, a number of examples in the Sapio GitHub, which is linked from that, uh, the book, uh, website, um, that you can go through and see how to implement various concepts and ideas. Really fascinating. Jeremy, you're, you're working on some mind blowing magic. I'm very happy that we have you here in the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Uh, and yeah, thanks for, thanks for the conversation. Uh, thanks for shedding a light on all what you do. Uh, and, and one more time, where, where can the people find you? Uh, yeah, I am at Jeremy Rubin on Twitter. So just hit me up there. I'm also that on telegram. Um, we have a, uh, option TV telegram group. If you're interested in helping drive this progress forward. Um, there's also some IRC rooms, um, but IRC is in a little bit of turmoil. So those are less active now. I see. Well, Piers, you heard it here first. Uh, OPSI TV will break the entire universe and make even more cool things possible. Uh, so stay tuned. It will be a lot of fun. At, and again, it's already usable nowadays, just with some trust trade-offs. But hopefully soon, in two weeks, when we have OPSI TV locked in and activated to the Bitcoin consensus rules, well, then uh, let an entire wave of new innovation be unleashed. Jeremy, one more time, I thank you very much for joining us. And Piers, see you on the next show. Bye-bye. Yeah.